Hello, everyone. Happy Friday. I'm going to let you all connect to sound. Hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 819th New Social Environment. I'm Chloe, Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the unique pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation on the work of artist Visita Abad, featuring Pio Abad, Camille Hoffman, Emmy Catedral, and Jessamine Batario. We're thrilled to welcome poet Lehua M. Titano here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgments are not a replacement for necessary decolonial work, but serve as a reminder of place of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement to sustain and enrich the stolen land that we're speaking from. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's guests and host. Pio Abad is a London-based artist whose wide-ranging work mines alternative or repressed histories and offers counter-narratives that draw out threads of complicity and entanglements between and within objects, incidents, ideologies, and people. Abad's work is informed by unfolding events in the Philippines where he was raised and is part of a number of international collections. Abad is also the curator of the estate of his aunt, Visita Abad. Camille Hoffman's practice is a ceremony of reconfiguration and critical reflection on the romantic American landscape. Taking inspiration from the Philippine weaving and storytelling traditions of her ancestors, along with traditional landscape painting techniques, she interweaves image with refuse to reveal seamless yet textured transcultural contradictions. She lives and works in New York and teaches at the Cooper Union. Emmy Catedral is a New York-based artist, writer, and educator whose installation, performance, texts, and collaborative acts of A-centering have been presented under pseudo-institutional personas and as herself. Emmy was born in Butuan and raised in East Harlem and Queens, where she lives and tends to the New York collection of the Bi-Coastal Pilipinex American Library. She is currently Curator of Public Programs at the Emergent Center for Art Research and Alliances, CARA, where she oversees the selection and operations of the bookstore. And our host today, art historian Jessamine Batario, specializes in modern and contemporary art. She received her PhD in art history from the University of Texas at Austin. Batario currently lives in Waterville, Maine, where she is the Lindy Family Foundation Curator of Academic Engagement at the Colby College Museum of Art. We are lucky to have Jessamine as a contributor to the Brooklyn Rail. And with that, it's my absolute pleasure to pass it over to Jessamine. Great. Thank you so much, Chloe. Uh, thank you all for being here. It's, it's really nice to see many familiar faces and names, and I'm, I'm glad that you could join us. Uh, so as Chloe said, I, I do live in Waterville, Maine, so I'm zooming in from Maine. That's the homeland of the Wabanaki. That's the Abenaki, the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet, the pa Penobscot, and the Passamaquoddy. And I'm, I'm thrilled to be hosting today uh, for the Brooklyn Rail this conversation uh, on uh, centered on the work of Pasita Abad with uh, my illustrious uh, accompanied participants here, Pio, Camille, and Emmy. Um, Chloe, if you could uh, show the slides, please. Um, I had occasion to see Pasita Abad's uh, major retrospective currently on view at the Walker Center in Minneapolis just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, whenever somebody asked me like, oh, how was it? How was it? And the first thing I really say is my mind was blown. Uh, this was such a terrific exhibition. Not only was there so much for me to see and think about, but I really did, I, I got really emotional. There were times when I felt like I was almost going to cry just because of what I was looking at. Um, I also walked out of that exhibition feeling that my heart was, was very full. And the show at the Walker, uh, and you'll see some installation views here, um, it's on view until uh, September 3 in Minneapolis, and then it travels to SF MoMA in the fall. After that, it goes to MoMA PS1 next spring and summer. And finally, uh, it concludes its run at the Art Gallery of Toronto. 
Uh, in the meantime, New Yorkers can get a taste of Pasita Abad's work at the Tina Kim Gallery. Uh, Colors of My Dream is on view now until June 17. And um, so today I have the great honor to be in conversation with, with as I said, Pio, Emmy, and Camille. And, and Pio will be giving us a walkthrough of the Tina Kim show, but I, I wanted this opportunity in my opening remarks to share a little bit of the installation views at the Walker because it's such a fantastic show. And I hope that everybody, I, I think many of the people here uh, are based in New York and you'll get a chance to see it soon enough. Um, so our conversation today will be anchored by Pasita Abad's work. Um, we'll be talking about the front of her work, the backs of her work, uh, you know, and the archive behind and around her work. And finally, we're also gonna go underneath uh, in the sense that we're gonna dive underwater. And um, we'll conclude also with resonances uh, with the relationship between uh, Pasita's work and also the work of Camille, uh, who, and I, you know, when I was thinking about who could we include in this conversation in terms of a, a contemporary artist, you know, living and working today, uh, whose work has resonances with Pasita's work, I immediately thought of Camille. Uh, and so we're going to get a chance to, to see some of Camille's work and kind of put that in conversation with Pasita's. And so this, this program is, is, is centered on Pasita's work, but also thinking about the legacy of that work and the connections to work being made today. Uh, I'm also hoping that the conversation will be quite organic, that all the panelists might chime in whenever they feel compelled to do so uh, as we're, 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 we're going through everything. So um, I feel like the Walker retrospective really gave me a sense of who uh, Pasita Abad was as an artist, as a practicing artist, a transnational artist, and also as a person. I, there were moments in the show where I, I got a sense of like what were her uh, values, her priorities, things that really um, caught her attention in her mind, just as a person living in the second half of the 20th century. There was some heavy material and also some really light material, things that made me want to chuckle or laugh, um, and things that were also really very provocative. And so there's quite a range there. And, and so perhaps we can begin with uh, Pasita the artist, because um, Pio is, uh, is an artist in uh, in his own right, of course. He's also the curator of Pasita's estate and her nephew. And so perhaps we could we could start there. Pio, perhaps you could uh, share with us a little bit about um, who Pasita was. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. It's a uh, good afternoon here. I think, I guess it's also good afternoon there. It's only five <laughs> hour difference. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's strange being back in London after two months of really celebrating Pasita in, in the US, you know, first in Minneapolis, where we had this, you know, incredible opening where about nearly 1200 people came to really celebrate Pasita's work. And in, and, and, and for most of that, it was the first time that people were encountering her work. Um, and then, you know, moving on to New York, where we, um, where we opened the show at Tina Kim Gallery. Um, I remember there was, there was a curator who um, approached, I think she, he, she approached me at the, at the opening of the Walker show, you know, and she said, you know, I didn't know who Pasita was a year ago, but I can't imagine my consciousness without her now. Um, and I was thinking about that because I've actually, I, you know, I, I've known her all my life. Um, and I've also, you know, had the privilege of really, of playing some role in making sure that people knew about her. Um, you know, before Pasita was an art historical figure, she was first and foremost my auntie and the most colorful, the most vivacious person I probably will ever meet. Um, I think I remember as a kid, like, you know, you would hear her voice and her, you know, her favorite uh, word was fabulous. So when you hear fabulous and a cackle, you know, she'd arrived. Um, and I think I think as an artist and as someone who, you know, who's very much steeped in art history, I think it's been a privilege to be able to, to play both roles really, and to make sure that, that the public that encounter her work do get a sense, do get a sense of both Pasita as the human being, um, Pasita as this colorful character, but also Pasita as a kind of a trans historical transnational figure um, that really um, navigated so many different histories that navigated so many different economies and actually you know she I, I always forget the number but I think you know throughout her life uh, she so she 
she was born in the late 40s and she passed away in 2004. And, you know, she lived in nearly lived and traveled in nearly 60 countries and I think visited 100 more. And I think that kind of peripatetic lifestyle really shaped her practice and um, and also really, really informed this incredible thirst to, to understand how other people live and to kind of situate her own experiences, um, you know, within those that are outside hers. Um, and when we were thinking about the Tina Kim show, uh, you know, in conversation with the Walker exhibition, we were trying to work out the best way to introduce Basita in New York when there's already, you know, a big retrospective with over a hundred works that had just opened, you know, a few weeks prior, but then is also is actually coming to New York City next year. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to focus on her abstractions and, you know, having having a conversation with with the gallery, you know, it 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 seemed like a, an interesting fit because a, you know, the the Walker show traverses so many different subject matters. Um, and this is uh, this is an opportunity to really focus on one. Um, you know, this, I mean, I guess it's also important to note that this is Pasita's first um ex first gallery exhibition um in New York. She she lived in New York briefly in 77 when um when she studied at the Art Students League, but you know, this is really the first time that people encounter her work. And I think for Pasita, and I think you you could probably get that sense through the images that Jessamine shared earlier, that you know abstraction wasn't really an absence of representation. In many ways, like with Pasita, like everything was, she was so attuned to a sense of place and a sense of politics and every, you know, every work that she produced is really infused with that kind of sensitivity and, and that awareness. Um, so the exhibition at Tina Kim, uh, traverses through a 32 year experimentation with abstract painting. Um, and with, with her, like, you know, when talking to art historians is interesting because they're trying to date each series and actually all series of hers overlap because she would make, you know, you know, all of these works all at the same time. I think, I think, uh, you know, before, before the phrase every, was it? everything everywhere all at once was coined into a film. She was already living it for, you know, three decades. Um, and so, you know, she would make her mass and spirits alongside her immigrant um, experience works, alongside abstractions, alongside um, her underwater paintings. So I think the kind of really the sensibility and the narrative, the sense of narrative in each of these kind of swam through her practice. Um, so the first room, um, is devoted to her earliest experimentations with abstractions, um, which interestingly aren't ex aren't really abstracts, but they're kind of um, depictions of very specific places in Manila where she grew up. So there's, I want to focus on a painting called Some Palette Walls, um, which was one of her earliest um, trapuntos. Um, I guess also there's so many things to introduce, but to, to those who are not entirely aware of, you know, the process that she'd created, uh, Pasita kind of coined this word trapunto um, from the word traping, trapungere um, as a way of, of making these um, paintings, which are, you know, painted, quilted, embellished, and then embellished some more. Um, and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of these large scale, almost mural sized paintings. Um, but this particular work, Some Palak Walls, um, was she made it when she just moved back to Manila after 12 years of being away. Um, and it depicts the crumbling walls of downtown Manila where Basita grew up uh, in an area called San Palak, which is in the kind of old colonial district. Um, and, you know, thinking about when she was making this 85 that was you know that was the dying days of the marcos dictatorship when you know the the regime was going through absurd measures to hide you know that criminality and the kind of dereliction that they've inflicted on the country um and so imelda would actually whitewash these crumbling walls or even build these um build kind of plywood structures in front of them so you know by focusing on the kind of the decay of the walls and the peeling paint 
there was something slightly subversive that Pasita was pointing to. Um, and I think it's also worth pointing out that, you know, the, the trauma of, of, of the Marcos era was actually very formative, uh, not just, you know, to her practice, but to, her, to our family as a whole, um, because it was her um, actions as an activist and the kind of ensuing political violence inflicted onto our family that led her to leave um, for San Francisco in, in 1970. Um, and so this sense of political engagement, um, but also the kind of the way that this engagement and this subversion is translated through exuberant color is very much a feature um, that runs through all of Pasita's work. Um, so from Manila, the exhibition moves to other places. So if we can maybe go to the slides in the second room. Um, I'm, I'm aware of time, so I'm going to um, quickly go through some of these works. Um, so the works in these in this room are actually from two um, two distinct series. So the the ones in the foreground um, are from a series called um, Asian Abstraction, um, which Pasita produced um, from the mid eighties to the late nineties, um, and they're based on um, a method of ink brush painting that she learned in Seoul. I, I mean, the idea of of these works coming from black and white drawings is probably hard to imagine um but you know she she as Pasita traveled she would often like learn various techniques and also exchange um methods of making with other practitioners so for instance when she was in Indonesia she would teach um local batik artists how to use oil paint in exchange for them teaching her how to do the kind of dye resist method that produced the fabric um, so I think I think with with these works, it's interesting because while it begins, you know, with a very traditional, you know, um, technique based in Korea, it kind of it becomes this polyphony of color, but also of material. Um, so, you know, even if the the lines are, are based on one thing, the embellishments are actually, you know, you, you see these mirrors um, kind of sewn onto each of these surfaces. Um, and there, that that's based on Rabari text on on Rajasthani textiles. So this idea of of every painting containing the world, containing these these communities, is 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 really, you know, is is really important to her. Um, and then the final series, which of which this this painting Bandung is part of, um, was a work that Pasita began began in um, in the, in. 2001, having spent some time in Indonesia, um, and it's a series called Endless Blues. Um, and I think here you can really get the sense of, of the role that textile um, plays in her work. Um, you know, the kind of, yeah, it, it, there's, there's, a, there's a phrase that, um, that I, I borrow too often just because it's so good. Um, and I think, um, you know, th this can be maybe a segue to, to kind of bring Emmy into the conversation, but th there, there's a phrase that um, the curator Shabir Hussain Mustafa talks about, where he, he describes like each of Pasita's um, paintings, uh, you know, as, as an archive of the third world. And, and I think, you know, this, this title, you know, Pasita was very, very, um, you know, she, her titles were very, very important to her. And, and she called this work Bandung based on, you know, on the conference in mean, Indonesia that, um, that was held between Afro, uh, between non-aligned countries in the global South who were trying to find a third way that wasn't, you know, that wasn't tied to, to the US government or, or to the kind of Soviet um, government. So, so, you know, this, this idea of, of, constantly finding different ways um, to navigate the world um, was really important to her. That's that's great, Pio. And what you're talking about also, even going back to the St. Pollock uh, painting, mm -hmm. um, something that I, I thought of when as you were speaking was, yes, yeah, St. Pollock is, is a place, but it's also a fruit. It's it's tamarind. And so yeah. that just uh, that just made me think about St. Pollock actually as um, indigenous to Africa 
and then became naturalized in Asia. And so even, you know, that evocation of the fruit also calls to mm -hmm. kind of this, this global movement or this transnational movement. And so really kind of um, fits with, with, with Pasita's own peripatetic kind of uh, lifestyle as you were talking about, um, which I thought was nice. Um, I, I, like, I love the idea that each painting is like a convergence of different communities and it's her, like mm -hmm. the way she sort of inhaled the present, being in the presence of different, different groups of people becoming translated into, into these inc inc really incredible, like, I always find it funny because image, these are wonderful images, but they just never do them justice to how textured and how, you know, one, one of the joys of having curated a number of Pasita's exhibitions is really watching people look at the paintings because they would sit down in front of each one and just watch it like a film. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely, you know, in, in looking at them, they're so large, like the scale is so large and definitely you can kind of stand there or sit there for a really long period of time and just let your eye rove and, and, and really take in all of the different textures of that surface. Um, and I love too that both in at the Walker and at Tina Kim, there are works that are installed, you know, in the middle of the room. And so really kind of demanding a viewer or asking a viewer to see everything from both, you know, mm -hmm. from multiple angles. And so I wonder if I think Chloe's probably queuing up that video now uh, at Tina Kim that gives gives uh, everyone a sense of what that's like. I think that's actually when when I I first, um, you know, was involved in curating Pasita's work in in 2018 when I was invited by Joselina Cruz, who's a, uh, the director of the Museum of Temperate and Design in Manila. And I think one one thing that we decided to do, which actually Pasita, I think she did it once, but but she 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 never actually uh, did it again. But we we hung the works, you know, free, you know, kind of freely um, from the ceiling rather than against the wall. Um, and in, in many ways with, with one Pasita Trapunto, you get two artworks, you know, there's this incredibly textured, mirrored, you know, sequined um, extravaganza <laughs> in the front. And then in the back, you really get a sense of, of, of the rigor and the kind of dedication involved in constructing these, these works. And, and, you know, this, I'm just imagining her because, you know, she, she'd often work on her own. She'd have one or two assistants. But the idea of her, like, having made the painting, then sitting in her studio, really puncturing through through these, uh, at, by that point, very thick um, paint, uh, very thick paintings is, is yeah, it's something that, that I, I, I mean, I, I've, I've had the privilege of seeing her work in her studio when I was, you know, in my teens. And just that, that level of, like, concentration, um, which you don't necessarily get with the kind of exuberance and the the kind of wildness of of of, of the front, but to get that an even an even greater understanding of the intensity involved in making them. Definitely. And I know uh, Emmy, you were particularly drawn to thinking about both the front and the back of 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 her works and how that might relate. Um, to, to archives, her archive, uh, her practice as an archive, also your own practice with archives. I'm wondering if you could uh, share a little bit about that. Yeah, hi everybody. <laughs> um, uh, I also just wanna kind of briefly introduce um, how I arrived at um, learning about Pasita, um, but also where I am at this moment. I'm, I'm someone for whom uh, the idea of Pasita, a goddess, this like whole expansive galaxy is is new um so uh i think that if i'd been you know at this nearly 1200 people gathering i would have been just as emotional as as you jasmine um so yeah i'm entering into this with a kind of independent reading i didn't want to try to you know like kind of immediately crash course into <laughs> like being a, a a instant um kind of um uh, expert, um, certainly not coming from it, uh, from any position of being a historian. Um, and I'm just really seeing her anew alongside so many others and excited about it. I'm so grateful uh, to Pio, to, to his tending to her work and Victoria Sung and everyone at the Walker who's kind of contribute to, contributed to all these bridgings. Um, and 
that we'll have this that we have this tome that we'll get to have in our hands that uh, Ruba Katrib in her in her conversation with Victoria last week said a book that could hurt someone. So yeah, I, I as a bookseller, I'm looking forward to this uh, fine brick of a lime green interruption of color insisting itself that we can we can hold. Um, just kind of a speaking from a librarian slash. Oh, there's Pia holding it up. Um, yeah, waiting waiting for more <laughs> waiting for more to circulate. Um, so yeah, I have I have questions that that are the other people are probably already you know on the ready to answer, so much, so much more equipped to answer. I wonder why, you know, we've known Dave Medalla and Kidlet Tahimek and and Manuela Campo and Santiago Bose, but not her. I've had I've had glimpses of her um, as caretaker of the Philippine X American Library collection in Queens. Um, she's on the covers of poetry books. You know, po poets have certainly engaged with with her paintings um different different sides of her um Eugene A. Gloria's uh recent book um in 2019 uh sightseer in sightseer in this killing city um uses her painting um uh my immigrant self I think is the title um there's a cool kind of um oh immigrant experience um there's a cool uh <laughs> kind of subtitle to that if that's like if my friends could see me now. Yeah, I just saw a flash image of it. Um, uh, I also recall, and I don't have my library on hand because I'm in the office. Um, Pat Patrick Rizal's American Kundiman um, uses LA Liberty on the cover. So I've certainly kind of had this, this uh, awareness of, of this painter, but not so much uh, kind of really this, this universe that's Basita. Um, that's overwhelming me now, but in like the best way possible. <laughs> There's this kind of impossible bigness to, to her all of a sudden. Um, and my very first close-up encounters of her was uh, were her paintings at the Carnegie, which are quite different from the Trapuntos that I, I I want that are currently at Tina Kim that that I wanted to really sit with today and thinking about the archive. Um, and for 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 their uh, for their like just presence, their exuberance. So. Um, yeah, like I like the idea of maybe sitting with with this small body um, and to speak to you from New York uh, for the people who are in New York that get to get to go to the to Tina Kim um, who don't uh, who haven't gone to the Walker. Um, please go today <laughs> immediately after this talk. Um, also open this weekend. Um, so yeah, I I guess I just want to now get into conversation and go back to I love how the uh, PO or maybe it was Jessamine who said that there was almost like a film like quality or people are looking at these almost as if it were a film, you know, their eyes moving and there is a kind of um, different temporalities happening with these, a kind of simultaneity because even preceding the very act of composing these is a process of gathering, right? There's, um, that's kind of how my access to her from these, from these, uh, from looking at these trapuntos, which um, I experienced in such a brief, brief time, I want to go back and return to them. Um, but I, I often return to um, the writer Ursula K. Le Guin's carrier bag theory of fiction, and that was kind of an access point to Pasita in these Trapintos, because thinking of her gathering and holding histories of textiles and stories through these pieces of cloth um, is a kind of uh, archive act in itself. Um, and um, there's all this ephemera that I, and I know she was such a collector of like news clippings and things like that, um, that I look forward to seeing in person. But, but I like the idea of just thinking of these very works as, a, as an archive um, act in itself. Um, Pio's mentioned in an earlier chat um, that among these include uh, batiks uh, from Indonesia during the fall of the Saharto regime, for example. And, um, you know, her collection of, of, of textiles as she moved through the world, but also then um, uh, construction and then therefore her own world making through these acts of gathering, including gathering methods of making as, as she moved in the world and met uh, other folks who she learned from in terms of methods of making. So there's um, the, the reverse of these paintings. There's always a kind of map revealed, right? Always available um, of the these world makings in the verse of each piece. And um, I imagine her act of gathering cloth and also kind of really imprinting herself with each piercing 
together each stitch, uh, in fact, a, a, an actual piercing, a puncture, punjere, tra punto, a quilting kind of defined um, by being in between punctures. So yeah, uh, a gathering at the same time and it really an assertion of herself and her presence with each, each puncture. Um, yeah, um, I'm not. I'm not sure. I mean, thinking of the archives as, as, and also as a librarian, I'm not sure what kind of role memory really had for her. How she, how much she um, thought about it, um, or she, if she thought of herself as a collector or holder of collective stories that way. Um, others can confirm that for me, and I have a, a sense of it. But I think that th there is like such a care and um, uh, and kind of accumulation of the stories that I've heard of uh, from of these paintings being easily rollable, portable, kind of hung, and also travel across continents. Um, so yeah, I, I like thinking about the simultaneity kind of presented in her works, um, what role abstraction, uh, to go back to what Pio was saying, abstraction and beauty kind of amidst her sense of place, something so specific as the surface and decay of the Sao Paulo walls um, and politics while you know living through ongoing Kind of uh, political processes and and states of martial law across the world, um, we get a sense of how the world kind of appears from her lines, but her lines also uh, kind of um, observation observation and construction being very distinctively intersecting, as she was also seemingly never still and um, always keeping watch, and even in her production was making beauty almost defi defiantly. And I also like thinking of it as. Um, almost a defiance in, in addition to the subversion that Pio described. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll pause there. I, I'd love to also get into when we do a deep dive into under the water. Um, yeah, thank yeah. you so much, Emmy. I really appreciate what you're talking about in terms of simultaneity. And I feel like that's something that, that really, um, and presence, those things I feel like are what really come out of abstract works. Um, because there isn't uh, a readily available narrative, at least like on the surface. And so it's really more about the experience of seeing something uh, and being present with, with a work. And um, when you're talking about like, you know, her, the stitching as a form of like imprinting, you know, as a recording of her own presence, of her own process, I really, really appreciate that too. And, and that's something that I thought about when seeing the backs of works and um, seeing the stitching really as a form of mark making and, and seeing them as line, I see them as traversal. And then again, I think about Pasita traversing like from one place to another and so on. And, and um, I began to see that too in other works as, you know, at first um, I was thinking about the stitching as a way to, you know, to, to, to bring fabric together, right? To, to put things together. But then the stitching, even in the fronts of works, if you look closely, become their own forms of mark making, their own forms of presence that I really appreciated whether the work was abstract or not, you know, it's it's not quite the binary in, in Pasita's work as Pio was saying. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I really appreciate that. And and um, so with that said, in thinking about kind of like the relationship between things, this kind of an in-betweenness, I, I wanna bring Camille into the conversation uh, in terms of, of a, a work that Camille, that you selected as, as being um, significant to you. And, and also like this, the underwater series, which I think are worth, you know, pardon the pun, but a deep dive. Um, and so, so here, here's uh, here are installation views of the walkers. The one at the far left was one that really, really caught my attention. I just took great delight in looking close up at those. Uh, I think they're called clown trigger fish. You know, one of them was like eating buttons or about to eat buttons, and I just it was it was joyful to me. You know, um, and this underwater series, I think it flashed even earlier. But there was a, a picture of Pasita in scuba gear. You know, these works were installed in Manila. Uh, and, and she showed up to the opening in scuba gear. That's the kind of um, loud, fabulous person that she was. And I, I, I got a sense of that, you know, as Pio was saying, it's, that came through in the Walker exhibition too. Um, so Camille, I, I, I wanna turn it over to you in, in thinking about, um, you know, this particular work, Filipino a Racial Identity Crisis and also the Underwater series and as a segue into you talking about your own work and your own uh, connections. Sure. Thank you so much, Jessamine. Um, yeah, I, I just want to start off by acknowledging what an honor it is to be here um, in, in conversation with you, Jessamine, and Pio, Emmy, Lehua, and uh, Chloe, uh, as well as everyone tuning in. Um, I'm so honored to share my work in conversation with the legacy of Pisita. Um, so I feel like she's one of those artists I 
wish I knew growing up, coming up in art history classes. And um, I'm I'm just now diving deeper into her work and it, in a way it does feel like a homecoming. Um, and uh, and uh, yeah, it's just it's just such a, a, a privilege. Um, there's something about like the way when I look at her work and particularly this this piece, um, Filipina racial identity crisis that, that like stood out to me. Um, where I feel like uh, her her spirit is really like present, um, and in a funny way, I feel like her paintings um, know me and make space for my own memories. And I, and as what I'm hearing from others, you know, it, it, she sort of makes space for a lot of other people as well. Um, so I know uh, we don't have a whole lot of time, but uh, in being asked to speak about my work, I thought I'd focus on one specific exhibition. Uh, that I feel resonates with Pasita's material exchanges and abstract poetry, as well as her um, fluid Filipina identity um, that is rooted in the sea and all the shores that the sea touch. <laughs> um, so I'll begin by saying that uh, as a painter, I myself create Im imagined and immersive landscapes that recontextualize found images and uh, materially blurs the lines between geographies and timelines. Uh, as someone who grew up in a biracial and multi-religious household as a second gen Filipina Jew in Latinx communities in inner city Chicago, Arizona, New Mexico, my practice is heavily driven by the way I've learned to move between worlds and speak multiple languages at once. Um, I'm also shaped by the rabbit hole research and organic community exchanges that have evolved in my life around a desire to connect with my ancestors and honor the indigenous lands upon which I am the guest. Um, here presently in Brooklyn, Lenape Hokan. Uh, I'm learning each day to surrender to my intuition while, uh, while the work, people and environments I find myself uh, in conversation with inform my path forward. And this is something that I really feel sort of an, a, a kinship with in terms of um, you know, learning about Pasita and her practice and the way she also um, moved about from community to community. So, uh, the images that are uh, rolling are from my 2022 exhibition, Sea and Mist, at the San Luis Obispo Museum of Art. Um, when the curator, Emma Saperstein, invited me to show, it wasn't until my site uh, visit and a quick Google search on the Filipino history in the area that I learned that just a 15 minute drive away from the museum in Moro Bay uh, was where the first documented landing of Filipinos and Asians for that matter, uh, took place on the continental U.S. and specifically northern Chumash land. And this was October 18th, 1857. At the time of my visit, uh, I was concluding an exhibition, Landing for Lolo, that honored my grandfather, Gil Palabrica, on Governor's Island, a former, uh, former naval base in New York. During World War II, like many other Filipino uh, men, he enlisted in the Navy in exchange for U.S. citizenship. So, when I arrived in California coming up upon the seafaring history of the first Filipinos landing right after felt like, uh, like a wink from him in the universe. So this, this prompt launched a year long exploration, not only in my studio, but learning more deeply about the long history of Filipinos in California uh, from several members the, of the of FANS, the Philippine American National Historical Society Central Coast chapter including um, their former president, Rosalie Marquez, um, as well as uh, conversations with uh, Scott Lathrop, the president of the Yaktitu Titu Yaktilhini Northern Chumash nonprofit, and ethnic and indigenous studies scholars, Ryan Buko and uh, Lydia Heberling from Cal Poly, among others. So for a little context, um, in a little kind of a mini history lesson, uh, for those who don't know, the Philippines was a colony of Spain from 1565 to 1898 and a territory of the United States between 1898 and 1946. The first Filipinos stepped foot on northern Chumash land and present day continental United States, United States at Morro Bay, California, um, October 18th, 1587, as I mentioned earlier. Um, they arrived as crew members ab aboard the Nuestra Señora de Buena Esperanza, which was uh, part of the Manila galleon trade. Um, under Spanish rule. After three days ashore, the crew met the Chumash people, which ultimately resulted in the death of one Filipino and one Spanish crew member. At the time of the 1587 landing and for the duration of the Manila galleon trade, 
many indigenous Filipinos referred to at the time as Luzon Indios or Manila men were exploited for their labor and seafaring expertise, uh, building and working the Spanish ships. They are also um, they were also often sent as scouts ahead of the Spanish crew members when landing in unknown territories. And then just kind of for their head, you know, like under U.S. settler colonialism, Filipinos have made up the backbone of the agricultural industry in California and uh, were central in leading some of the earliest labor movements in the 20th century U.S. Similarly, nurses were brought to the U.S. by the American government to support its uh, understaffed healthcare industry. So um, reflecting on this history and, and much of which I kind of came to in the development of this project, um, I uh, began to blend specific materials into my installation that re resonated with me on a personal and uh, level and, and contemporary level. Um, these ma materials included vintage handwoven pina cloth, um, nurses gowns, uh, stock images, kind of romantic landscapes of California vineyards and uh, Philippine rice patties uh, and a bench uh, we fashioned after a thousand year old Balangay ship unearthed in um, Butuan where um, uh, Emmy's uh, I know uh, ancestry is <laughs> from. So it was, it's also located very close to the island where my grandfather grew up. Um, you'll probably see it sort of scrolling around, but but the 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 bench sort of at the center of the of the gallery is is what I'm referring to. Um, I wanted to pay tribute to the long legacy of uh, Filipino people in California dating back to 1587, while critically acknowledging the enduring impact that Spanish and American colonization had had on indigenous ha, or has had on indigenous peoples of both the Philippines um, and California. So, the title for the show. Sea and Mist is a homophone. Um, while thinking about the majestic beauty of the California coast, I was also considering how one might see with uh, expanded senses as well as discover a, a mist history, which lives on in the water, if even uh, in the fog. Um, the pina cloth, cloth that I use is, has also been sort of an avenue. I know um, Earlier, um, Pio and Jessamine were sort of um, mentioning the uh, sun pullock fruit um, and um, the kind of global uh, conversations around that in relation to her work. Uh, I was also thinking about, um, particularly in the piece that I was referencing earlier, of the, the uh, racial identity crisis. She inc includes a reference to pina cloth. And um, pina, uh, pineapples and pina cloth are considered very sort of like traditional um, textile as a considered very te traditional textile and fruit in the Philippines. And at the same time, um, sort of emerged during the Manila Acapulco galleon trade where pineapple is uh, in fact native to the Americas. Um, so I, I somehow was able to obtain this, um, this antique pina cloth and work with it as, as a means to collaborate um, with my ancestors, but also thinking about these very like layered um, global histories that are intertwined um, in the material. So uh, the the embroidery of that pina cloth and, and the layering on my paintings that was also in collaboration with my mother and um, one of my students whose name is also Camille Levy. Um, so I um, w I was um also interested in sort of like transforming, I don't know if we can go back or, uh, to an earlier shot of like the larger install, um, but uh, I was also interested in transforming the room in its entirety with paint while incorporating the cracks uh, of the original foundation of the museum. Um, so as I sort of sculpted my own archipelago landscape from the architecture of, of the museum, I was thinking about the ways in which um, it echoed the design of the neighboring 1772 San Luis Obispo Mission uh, de Tolosa. Um, and as uh, Scott uh, Lathrop shared with me, the mission was known to hold you know, violent history for many of his Chumash ancestors. So it was something that really um, materially I was trying to find some, um, some through lines of acknowledgement and also um, uh, critical looking. Um, and additionally, by, by centering my installation around the Balangay boat um, that you see pictured here, 
I wanted to make the deeper um, global seafaring wisdom of indigenous Filipinos the sort of axis of the show. This wisdom of water and navigation by the stars, stars uh, precedes European contact by thousands of years and brought so much of our Austronesian ancestors as far as the Americas and uh, uh, as far as the Americas and beyond. And uh, even um, you know, if most history books have yet to acknowledge that. So the Balangai is a, is a bench. Um, it's also an invitation for people to sit and reflect on their own orientation in an in-between landscape um, that blurs the lines between earth, sea, and sky. And uh, one of the last uh, images that I think sort of flashed up um, was uh, in the conclusion of the show, it ended up actually um, at more, the Moro Bay site where uh, fans uh, rededicated the uh, 1995 plaque um, last October. So the life of this, this boat sort of lived on and uh, the nurse's gowns sort of embossed on top somehow managed to, to survive the fog as well. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, so I'll, although this show is over and this work, this work continues to inform my practice and my upcoming projects around the country, it's almost a cosmic joke now that um, my work, even if not initially intended, like Pasita brings me back to the theme of water. Um, it's a great honor to be here sharing my work with you while honoring the memory of Auntie Pasita uh, as she shows us our ancestors from all timelines and geographies lives on in us. And I look forward to all the ways in which we get to continue uh, learning and growing together uh, with you all and with our ancestors by our side. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camille. That was a, a really terrific overview of, of that very recent show of yours. And that's exactly what I was, was thinking about when I, when I saw uh, Posita's underwater series at the Walker and how Posita's work, um, you know, these are large scale works and they're hung kind of individually, but when taken as a whole, as an install, as an inst it feels like an installation to me, or it has that capacity to, to bring that kind of feeling when you walk into the room. And I think even in some of the archival material that, um, that showed how many of these works were installed in Manila, you know, there were there were other aspects that made it feel like a like a contemporary installation even now. Um, and in thinking about water, you know, thinking about it even conceptually, I mean, the Philippines is an archipelago of over 7,000 islands. And so I feel like that's something that, you know, something that, that comes to mind for me or something that I think about a lot and, 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 and how that shapes the way we, the way Filipinos or Filipinx uh, folks uh, move about the world or, or relate to each other and the world. Um, I find a rootedness in that. It was Pio actually in an, in an earlier email as we were saying this mentioned um, a form of underwater rootedness or representations of rootedness underwater which I've thought to be or found to be a really poetic way of framing uh, that kind of relationship rootedness underwater what could that mean you know so um, using these works and also that's the resonances I see too with Camille's work um, are those kind of like material investments or material interests you know in in textile in fabric and in in found objects um and and making something of this scale to craft an experience for the viewer um which goes back to what we were talking about with emmy in terms of like presence and simultaneity in front of Pasita's work uh but in thinking about water and underwater i know emmy you wanted uh to say something about that too and, and hoping for a deep dive into this i kind of wanted to open it up um, before we go to q a with the audience to open it up to the whole panel camille pio um and Emmy, you know, uh, any any forming thoughts about that can be anchored by Pasita's underwater series um, and relationship to the, to water, to the sea, to the ocean, because being Filipino means living on an island or having roots to an island. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh. Thank you for sharing all of that, Camille. I just really briefly wanted to share um, that the idea of the, a Balanghai boat as a bench is so lovely to me because actually the word Balanghai lent itself to the word Barangay, which is a kind of, you know, small political district. And so kind of like uh, kind of intertwined through the idea of community. So like a boat leading to the word for uh, district. Um, 
uh, and how that is, uh, how the bench as a boat resonates. Um, I really love that. Um, I, I don't, I, I kind of now forget what I was going to say about wanting to go back to underwater, but I think maybe just quickly I'm thinking, does it say 1986? Yes, I, I want to like just note the year that that was and maybe Pio can elaborate more on that and the actual kind of exact timeline of that moment as it related to um, the end or as, as towards the end of, of the Mar first Marcos era, the EDSA revolution also having um, taken place that very year. Um, but uh, but um, also like within, sorry, we're, oops, go ahead. No, 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 finish your thought. <laughs> um, uh, like to think of all of that happening while, well, there's like joyous image and these paintings of the beautiful underwater um, is happening. I, I uh, uh, like a brief kind of comparison that helps me bring Pasita to a kind of continued resonant place and a way to understand her in the present and not necessarily always comparing her to other artists of her time is, is, is um, uh, just, it, it, it occurred to me uh, thinking about very recently hearing and listening to translations of Lagondan pop love songs translated uh, into English by the curator and poet Sarah Beery Moses. And, and these songs were mostly written largely in the 70s, also during the, the regime, uh, a regime and despotic rule of Idi Amin. Um, there's a simultaneously there, you know, kind of peripheral or wayward act of, of, of research translating these um, uh, within that time. And so kind of, you know, arguing that and certainly how I understand that act is as kind of having an implicit political meaning or, or protest or refusal, um, you know, love songs were enduring that time of extremism. And so like when I think of this year and seeing this image and, and these beautiful underwater photos um, in 1986, uh, yeah, I just wanted to maybe bring those together. Yeah, and go ahead, Pia. No, I just wanted to pick up on Jessamine's like, uh, you know, the, the the sense of rootedness in these works, um, because I think for those who have seen um, the, the Walker exhibition, you know, the, the work tra like Pasita traversed so many different coordinates. And and I think that's partly why she was she evaded visibility for a while, because she she kind of insisted on you know, navigating the margins and these margins she became kind of the center of her world. Um, but these, these underwater works are actually the most extensive um, representations of home in her work. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to think of them as depictions of the Philippines um, at, at a very particular time um, when, you know, when the Philippines was kind of going through this euphoric sigh of relief after you know two decades of despotic rule and kind of kind of kleptocratic uh ransacking um and so as she was having moved back to manila at that moment she she was kind of reacquainting herself with home at a very particular moment when filipinos were in a way reacquainting themselves with themselves <laughs> um and so this was an in invitation to the public to, to look at the country in a different way, literally to kind of go underneath the surface. And, and you know, it, they're so romantic, they're so lush, but they're also, they're also um, incredibly political in that insistence, in that insistence of, of, a, new, of a new way of understanding um, representations of home, representations of rootedness, and how, you know, the kind of, uh, yeah, the, you know, we are, I think it's interesting bringing up Balangay and Barangay that, you know, we are fundamentally boat people that, you know, have to find each other. Um, often, I, I think at the moment, the Philippines is is uh, is is, is in a re reliving this state of disconnectedness. But, you know, I think that ebb and flow of um, of of existing in, our, in an archipelago hopefully means that at some point, <laughs> these these connections will be established again and, and and it's moments like this and it's it's gatherings of communities you know brought together for instance by Pasita's work that that give me hope that you know the this current um, moment where we seem to be reliving not 1986 but 1972 um you know yeah I, I, I don't know how I'm ending this but <laughs> 
Yeah, in thinking about Balangay, Barangay, and also, you know, reacquainting yourself with home. And, and that's, I think that's one reason also why I got fairly emotional. This was one of the places where I got fairly emotional at the Walker, was walking into this, this particular gallery to see these scenes. Pio, you're right. I think these are really romantic and really lush. Um, and I think, um, you know, within our historical discourse, when you say that word now, you know, that, that could have like a negative connotation. But for me, it's really the opposite. It's quite positive uh, mm -hmm. in the sense that it does give hope. You know, it does, it, 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 I feel tethered in a way, in a very positive way to these images. And there were there are even some, you know, that are that evoke very specific memories for me. There's a particular work in this room. I think it's called Hundred Islands. That's something that I experienced as a child being there. Mm -hmm. And um, and being somebody who's of the diaspora, who left the Philippines um, when I was really quite young, even though I was born there. This is something that, you know, it somebody who's always on the move, I think of home is like where I am. You know, home is so many places. And when I see these, you know, I'm reminded that. In a, in a larger way as a historical subject, this is also my home. And, and that is, is hopeful in that regard, I think. Um, so I really, I really appreciated this particular gallery. I think um, just, yeah, just to kind of make it really literal, actually, there's, there's one painting in this, in this room that I find quite hilarious because it, it's my dad's, um, it's from my dad's collection. And it was always in the living room um, right behind um, a flat screen TV. So I've never actually seen it in full until <laughs> until Vicky had this amazing idea to bring all the underwater works together. But, you know, in terms of witnessing history with this as the backdrop, it was literal. Like we would watch the news and this painting would be in the back. <laughs> so you'd be like watching Duterte and then there's this underwater thing behind you. So just just to take things in, the, in, in an interesting note that it like these have also been witnessed to various kind of movements, uh, uh, tectonic shifts in, in Philippine history. <laughs> Definitely. And I feel like, okay, so we're, I'm, I'm also really mindful of the time. I feel like our conversation has ranged quite uh, broadly, um, you know, in thinking about Pasita's life as, as, as traveling to and living in so many places and thinking through um, the surfaces of her works, also connecting this to Camille's practice, um, which is, you know, is, this is a, a contemporary work. Camille's practice is a contemporary practice, but also reaching back to history and thinking about ancestors and home in that sense, in a, in a historical sense. Um, we've covered a lot. Uh, so I, I, I wanna take this moment to now um, open up the, the conversation to any questions uh, from the audience. Thank you all so much um, for sharing your work and your perspectives. And, and I look forward to hearing what some of our, our guests, how, how they might be responding and what questions they may have and comments as well. Gosh, that was incredible. Thank you all so much for, for your dialogue. Um, and we do have a couple of questions. I do encourage everyone in the audience to post your questions in the chat and we'll be sure to get to you as well. Um, but the first question is going to be from Lynn Crawford. Lynn, I'll give you the chance to unmute. Thank you. This was extraordinary. And um, Camille, it was just delightful to see your work. Um, you know, along with this, because it, it just, you know, a legacy continues. Um, I want to, the way I understand the difference between a shaman and a Western doctor is that Western doctors impose their idea of healing on um, the consumer and that shamans absorb the, the condition. And then therefore, that's how they heal. And the entire time I was watching this, I kept thinking of her absorbing um, with such depth and specificity things that she would then put into her work. I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I felt that. And um, I just wondered if what you had to say about that. So. Um, I think that's a that's a beautiful um, analogy and observation. Um, 
I guess, I, I mean, I, I can only speak from my own experience and, and, and practice as an artist, but um, certainly there's elements of Pasita's work and, and learning about the ways in which, you know, she was so engaged with the communities that she moved um, within um, that it seemed that the work that she made was a direct reflection and response and sort of like metabolizing of um, the stories she would hear and um, the like material techniques that she would exchange with others. I think, I mean, I, I'm curious, you know, Pio, maybe you can you speak to this more. I don't know if, if, if she ever considered that herself to be, you know, a, a part of a spiritual practice, but in my opinion, that is something that is, that feels quite spiritual to me. <laughs> um, it's something that, that connects um, at a, at a, at a deeper and energetic level, um, uh, and, and sort of manifests in material form. So I don't know, but that's something I want to continue to think on. Well, I, I think, you know, I, I think in terms of spirituality, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that, but I think, you know, for Pasita, the process of making was, you know, brought all of these emotions, all of these reflections onto the surface. I, I think of this incredible, um, work that's actually at the, at the walker at the moment and we're still trying to work out if it's going to fit into the lift of MoMA PS1 because it's so big um but it's it's this incredible work um that Pasita made after watching um a ritual an exorcism ritual in Sri Lanka and it's it's these demons um Sri Lankan demons um and initially it was it, it, it was supposed to be about this this ritual that she witnessed when when she was visiting there but as she finished the work in um, in Manila, um, the work, which is probably the largest she, work she's ever made, um, it ended up being called Marcos and his cronies. So this kind of, the way that, you know, um, her experiences refract other histories and other, other, exp other experiences, other, other forms of knowledge, other um, rituals of, of other rituals. I think, I think this constant, need to refract to encompass the world I, I think that, that there is there is spirituality in there and there is a strong sense of you know there is this urge to to make people understand what what you know how how, how things can be seen in different ways I think the mirror the fact that they're all mirrored you know I I, I always love that that they the, the paintings reflect and deflect and you know, re refocus the eye in many different ways. And I think the practice is so committed to that. That was an amazing question, Lynn. Thank you so much. Um, that's a really good segue to Eileen's question. So I'm going to give Eileen the chance to unmute and ask. Hi, you can hear me. Um, yes. This, again, was a wonderful presentation, and I'm grateful to you all. My question is, um, although I'd been per, um, aware of Pasita's works, I have to confess that I did it, I was godsmacked by a particular detail that became the more, the most resonant aspect of her work for me, which paradoxically is the most muted visually, and that's the use or insertion of mirrors into her works. Um, because I, I, if you obviously her works are very colorful, what could be more riotous than what she's presented would be the actual life and actual work itself. And she was able to capture that, I thought, through the mirrors. And I thought, you know, I'm interested in whether she had talked more about the use of mirrors besides the reference to the inspiration from the Indian textiles or if anyone else has had uh, theorized about that. And I'll just also say that I loved her mirrored work so much that I put it under cover of my book, um, Murder, Death, and Resurrection, because as a poet, I thought the whole point of the mirror by bringing in the reflection of the viewer, is sort of like a metaphor for how a poem can be read, that a poem is becomes alive only through the reader's or the audience's response. But I'm interested in what she actually has said about the mirrors. 
I guess that will have to be me to answer that. <laughs> or um, what others have theorized. I, about. I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't recall anything, you know, any theory that she sort of kind of purposed into the work. Um, but I think, you know, she's such a material and cultural omnivore that, you know, as, you know, yes, it, it does begin with, with, with this obsession with Rajasthani textiles, but as she, I feel like as Pasita uses a motif, it kind of gains in poetry. Um, and it's that act of kind of, of kind of, I don't know, put it, putting it on the surface, but then also like insisting on doing it again and again and kind of lovingly embroidering each one. It's that that haptic gesture, I think, that that in a way supersedes theory for me. Um, and and I, I I keep on thinking about, and I think this maybe kind of sums up a lot of the things you're talking about, um, that she, in her first exhibition, in I think her first big exhibition in 83, you know, she writes, you know, I want, I want people to, through my work, I want people to have a better understanding of the world. But then through these mirrors, like you always see glimpses of yourself in the work. So as, as each, you know, Trapunto is this incredible um, map of, 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 you know, multiple locations. There's always these, like, you're always kind of bothered by your own <laughs> reflection. Um, and I feel like that, that play with, that play with color, but that, that play with reflection, you know, um, especially when, you know, we've, there are some works that are just literally all mirror. Um, so you get this kind of like, distorted sense of self by looking at this work. Um. Thanks for, thank thanks you. And, <laughs> yeah, and thanks Eileen for that question. I, I was noticing mirrors too, as I was walking through the Walker exhibition, there were particular works that showed or that included lots of little tiny mirrors. And I think going back to even the way you framed your question and, and going back to what Pio has just shared now, like, um, and Pasita wanting to present people or viewers with a better, better understanding of the world. For me, I don't, you know, I can't speak to what Pasita thought, but like for me as somebody who experiences the work, um, a better understanding of the world, I mean, I, you have to, I would have, to, I have to think of that in a relational way. Like I can't think of a better understanding of the world without my own better understanding of the world, right? And so having the mirrors there, I think what they effectively do is make you confront yourself relative to that world. And, and I think it also goes back to an earlier part of the conversation that we were having um, today in presence, in simultaneity, and in kind of reveling in the experience of looking. It's, I think it really, seeing yourself in a mirror in, on the surface of one of these works is really kind of, um, it's emphasizing that. It's emphasizing the presence, the experience of being there, of, of, of self-confrontation relative to the world. I, and I don't know, this is a, I'm kind of thinking aloud right now. This is not something I've theorized, you know, previously or whatever. This is I'm kind of uh, riffing off of my own experience of, of the work and and your question. And I really appreciate it. I think it's a it's a really provocative one and worth um, thinking more about. Yeah. Oh, you're muted. Thank you so. Oh, hang on, Eileen. I'll give you the chance to unmute, and you can. Um, thank you. Um, I was just remembering what uh, Pio quoted from uh, Pasita when you said that abstraction is, does not mean no representation or something like that. So I thought that the mirrors was just a dead on spot on manifestation. I'm not an art critic, but one of you all should write more about this aspect, please. <laughs> thank you so much for that amazing question, Eileen. Uh, that was so generative. I think I think one of the joys for me, you know, having having cared for this work alongside um, Pasita's husband and and Jack and his wife Christy, is actually unleashing the Pasita multiverse to the world <laughs> and seeing how it's read, how it can be reinterpreted, and 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 you know that will be <laughs> that's the joy of actually having spoken about Pasita for a while, just watching people watching watching and listening to people speak about her. Um, is yeah is is incredible <laughs> amazing our next question is going to be from isa isa i'll give you the chance to unmute to ask 
Hi, everyone. I have a question about scale. Um, uh, as an artist who, like, when I've made larger artworks, you know, it's it's challenging at times, depending on what type of space I, or studio I have access to. And so given the fact that she traveled so extensively, I'm curious, how did she achieve the production of her artworks? Um, what Just what did that look like in terms of how she used space? Um, and I, I have sort of ph philosophical ideas about how, you know, her transnational perspective influenced the subject matter of her work, but also I'm just trying to figure out when I saw the exhibition at the Walker, um, those ocean series of paintings, that's like the seventh room in the exhibition. So it's after gallery, after gallery, after gallery of these enormous works. So that's my question. How did she produce such large paintings? I think ski bags were her friends. Um, um, so I think when she she kind of devised trapunto making as a method specifically for it to be portable. So even if they're huge, you know, they're actually, you can easily roll them and they roll quite tight. Um, so the kind of practicality of movement is actually built into the design of these these monumental things. And, and I think she, I think she, she was very much inspired by by tankers, which you know, which she I think in, encountered in, in in a trip in Kathmandu. But that that method of actually something big becoming easily transportable. Um, but saying that, like I think you know, the fact that you know that the large works, um, she only really started making the large works, you know, when she moved back to Manila. Um, and and had you know had a big studio and I think since then she's been able to kind of get these you know these fairly big spaces in DC and Jakarta and Singapore I think whenever I visited their home the largest room was wherever it was was Pasita's studio so like dining room was somewhere else but she always occupied um in space but I think that that portability has been key in allowing her to to produce such a you know some vast quantity and you know vast scale. Asa, that was a great question. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask the last question. Um, my question is about time. Um, in an earlier conversation, Pio, you mentioned uh, Pasita's own unique awareness of legacy and of of archive as she was making her works. And I'm also curious how and if her work, and this could be a question for Camille and Emmy as well, if her work changes your own relationship to time or has has impacted how you think about your own work relative to time and archive. Um, I guess. I, I guess for me as an artist, certainly, you know, it's, <laughs> it, I, I, I go back to what Emmy was saying um, earlier about how, how come she didn't know about Pasita when she knew about, you know, a, a few other kind of Filipino diasporic um, artists. And, and, and I think about visibility in the context of time and, and actually the, the work of an artist gaining visibility after an artist um, is no longer with us. Um, and how so much of that is is like you know this kind of strange combination of of luck of time of of somewhat of love actually yeah I think the underlying um the underlying narrative on you know with all this is like you know Jack kind of devoted all of his resources and you know into to kind of luck lovingly taking care of these works when no one cared about them for you know two, two decades no one no one knew about them for two decades um but that act of like you know kind of taking care of an estate is ultimately like an act of hope um it, more than that is an act of faith um and so I, I i'm not really sure if i'm answering the question but this sense of like yeah, how an artwork lives and how it can outlive an artist. Um, you know, Pasita certainly like this incredible 
I, I'm still sort of not really, I'm still really overwhelmed, but you know, by the incredible response we've had the last, um, last few years, even the last two months that, you know, suddenly like she's found an audience that evaded her, um, in her, in her lifetime. And, and certainly like that, it, it really like, it really shifts your sense of proportion of, you know, what, what you're doing in the studio on a day to day and, and how it can kind of disappear and then reemerge, um, so beautifully, um, is, is, yeah, it's really overwhelming, but, you know, in some ways also really encouraging. I think from the standpoint of time, um, when I look at the, the large span of Pasita's practice, um, I find myself thinking about choreography or dance rather, maybe more, more, more specifically, um, even, even its relationship to music and how there are um, a range of tempos that um, speak most appropriately to a specific mood or a specific story or a specific exchange. And um, between kind of looking at her abstract works um, that have these very quick sort of gestural um, moments and then um, very, at the same time, uh, hyper detailed um, needlework um, that you know, you can you can only imagine by looking like what that the duration of that like required, um, just like through her body and through her attention. I just think about her almost as a master of of time, where she can sort of speed up and slow down as she pleased um, from painting to painting, and even within the course of of one painting. And I'll add something quickly, um, just thinking about time in the archive and Pasita, that um, like she she knew herself, it's seemingly as a as a as a product of of historical processes, and that includes um collective historical processes and the way she collected modes of making and 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 materials as she traveled. Um there was a way in which she kind of modeled a, a life of inventorying, a kind of, you know, way of gathering in, in her own way um, that that left us also with such a treasure <laughs> trove that I'm, that, you know, it's, that it's, I guess, um, how I think about her work in time is also just thinking about how we're so lucky to then have this show and book and, um, and, and gathering of, of, things that she that she uh left for us i guess that she that she, the inventory that she left is then up on us to kind of continue um uh to 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 protect and you know so that so that other other artists uh, are not finding ourselves themselves like me saying oh man i wish i knew about this earlier you know um so yeah that's all i'll i'll add that was amazing. Thank you all so much for those answers. And thank you so much for this conversation. Um, I think that's the end of our Q&A. Um, so at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a reading. And it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Lehua M. Titano to the virtual stage. Lehua M. Taitano is a queer Samaro writer and interdisciplinary artist from Jigu, Guahan, and co-founder of Art 25, Art in the 25th Century. She is the author of two volumes of poetry, Inside Me an Island and A Bell Made of Stones. Taitano's work investigates modern indigeneity, decolonialization, and cultural identity in the context of diaspora. And with that, I will pass it over to Lehua. Papa de San Buenos Toro Hamsu, Guahusi Lehua Taitano, Familian Cabeza San Quetu, Giza Zigu Guahan. Hello, everyone. I'm really happy to, to join you today. My name is Lehua Taitano, and I'm from the island of Guahan, um, also known 
as Guam. I'm excited to share some poetry with you today. I have two poems that um, I would like to share, but I want to talk just a little bit about a couple of things I'm thinking about. One in response to this um, wonderful presentation. So thank you all um, for that really thoughtful dive into Pasita's work. The one thing that came up for me as I was looking through the images is that I recognize something of myself in her and her work. And the thing that I recognize most is um, I've often thought that in former lives, I have been uh, a number of different kinds of birds. And I have these visions or memories of, of being a kind of bird in, in some past life. And um, it made me think of this one line that I have in an essay that I, that I wrote about um, indigenous pedagogy. And I think, uh, I think this could describe Pasita as well. And it says, um, in some lifetimes, at least I am avian. And in one life, I was a pelican. In another, I'm a flitting bower bird, an architect of tending. I gather neat geometries and moments of color, arranging patterns in the name of love and order. And I just, all of those images, um, of Pasita's work made me think of that. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, some of you may be aware of my homeland, Guam, through um, brief news mentions of disasters that befall our island. And that's usually the, the only screen time, unfortunately, that we get. Um, in most recent news, there's been um, a really destructive typhoon that has come through and we, uh, my family and I have been kind of dealing in, with the wake of that devastation in the last few days. Um, I haven't been able to get in touch with everyone in my family because of power outages and loss of internet and cell service. Um, but I do know that um, some of my family are physically safe. I have, uh, my oldest sister lives on Guahan and several of her children two of whom um, are adults and have their own families. And unfortunately they've lost their homes. So um, either totally ruined by, by flooding and wind, um, in some cases, nothing salvageable. So with that in mind, um, that is reflected coincidentally or not in some of the poems that I'm gonna share with you. But I also have um, started a fundraiser for my immediate family to help them get some basic needs like uh, clothing. They, they literally have lost everything but the clothes on their back. So that's gonna be a link in the chat. And I understand not everyone can donate. That's totally understandable, but it would be really meaningful to me if you could um, amplify that fundraiser by sharing it with uh, your networks so that it doesn't just stay a little blip in the news, but we can do some, some real, an impactful change. Um, so I'm going to read you uh, two poems from my most recent collection, uh, Inside Me an Island. I don't know if you can see it, probably not because my background is crazy. Um, but the, the background information for this first poem entitled Shore Song is, it is a reflection of one of our um, Tsamoru creation stories where we know the world, our world was created by siblings, um, specifically Puntan and Fontna. Um, there is a third sibling, Chaifi, who's often not referenced. Um, but here's my response. Shore song. Our people were shaped from stone and the pulsing sea. Sisters crouched body, wave needed, salt lapped, until we tumbled from her, of her, of them, all strong, strong, and whole together. Birds regarded our sea foam anklets, our slippery ropes of hair, our cheeks full of pebbles, and scattered from the shore, singing. We opened our new mouths to our own chorus, crooning, sister brother. We are sun, moon, sky, water, earth, all siblings. And the last poem I'll share with you, I actually um, wrote sitting in my garden in front of this beautiful wisteria 
um, who's pictured behind me. Um, and it was a time when there were a lot of things in the news about nuclear threats from North Korea and how our island would be targeted. And for those of us who live in diaspora, when we encounter um, news of threats, whether it be weather related through climate change um, or through global militarization, ongoing colonization, um, you can feel helpless. And this is my attempt to reach out to uh, my Chamorro family um, and Chamorro people around the world um, in those moments. So this is called a love letter to the Chamorro people in the 21st century. Dear, I will begin this in the middle since all of my letters have always been to you, even if you haven't realized it. Go back and look, you'll see. All of my imaginings, my histories, my deaths and rebirths, my love and heartbreak, all of my words, my wind-blown hair, my lemon sticky wrists, my fish bones, slings, feathers and offerings, my twig fires and heaped mounds of husks, my paint dipped elbows and muddy feet, the bowers I weave into a home scented bowl that might call you to me. The way I can sometimes chant down the sea and coax a wave to carry my heart to you, the salt on my thighs, the clutch of shells I carry in my deepest pockets. They're always for you, addressed to you. So you'll understand, I hope, if I pick up where we last left off, which is always at horizon. Who but a horizon so keenly feels how we are kept at each other's distance? Because much more than wind carries so many of us away from our islands, because we are made to consider our oceans as walls, because we fumble the jar lid of tongues we've been made to bury because our sails have been burned, because our grandmothers have been raped and worse, because the bones of our beloved are being paved over and over with layers of poison and dollars that bear faces, not our own. Because the news tells us who we are not, because our families are separated, because distance means we cannot always conjure the scent of our auntie's cheek, because we are visited by our ancestors in dreams, because we are visited by our ancestors in waking life, because our nieces and nephews struggle to remember the last time we visited. Because two or more, excuse me, because two more of our sons and daughters have enlisted, because their enlistment might return them home whole or in pieces or not at all because diabetes has taken another pair of our eyes, because we cannot tread on pieces of our own land without clearance, because we keep words like clearance and deployment and strategic and stationed in the bowl with our keys by the front door, because we can count to a thousand in Spanish, because we can count to the apocalypse in English because our crow song has vanished, because our trees are blighted, because our reefs are targets, because we're always in the path of military maneuvers, because I must write this to you in English, because we are trending, our faces are lit up with the glow of emojis, each shedding a single tear, because our petitions do not go viral, because our non Chamorro friends text us to say, what a shame, but can they also get that Kelleguin recipe? Because we're shouting into the Pacific, because our voices are choked in the fumes of B-1 bombers and 140 mile per hour super typhoon winds, because I could not sleep, I could not eat, because I do not want to get my mind off of things I'm writing to you. I close my eyes against the morning sun in my garden, where I reach out to you across space and time, and I hear you. I hear you laughing and loving and crying in despair and resistance, in anguish and abhorrence. What's more, I feel you. The salt in our blood carries droplets of the ocean, 
no matter where we are. Inside us is a liquid web connecting our beating hearts. I am quiet so I can perceive your tugs, the delicate density of your tangles. And I want you to know that I'm always a little scared, but I'm also hopeful. Because I can feel you, I can feel our collective fear. We're proud, so sometimes we deny it, keep it hidden like a lozenge under the tongue. We're resilient, so we know that it will eventually dissolve. And when it does, we will still be here, tending our plants, casting our nets, shaping our canoes, riding our bodies into existence. I am writing to you, Manietlu, aunties, uncles, nennies, cousins, kin, and all of our Sina. I'm writing to tell you that I see you. I hear you. I feel you. I love you. You matter. I hope this letter finds you until we can gaze together upon a horizon full of sails. Sina Ma'asi, thank you so much for your patient attention. I'm really honored to be here with you today. Thank you. Wow. Lehoa, that was amazing. Thank you so, so much for reading your work with us today. Uh, thank you as well, of course, to Pio, to Camille, to Jasmine, to Emmy. Uh, thank you to the team at Tina Kim, especially Diana, who helped prepare a lot for this conversation today. Um, we'd also, of course, like to thank the Terra Foundation for American Art, who sponsor this program, the NSE, and who make these daily conversations possible, and for their support of our growing archive, which you can find on the Rails YouTube channel. For 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our free monthly publication and public events like this one, our daily NSE. You can check the chat for a link to donate to support the Rail. And if you're free Monday... We'll be uh, doing a virtual screening on Memorial Day of Fragments of Paradise, an intimate look at the life and work of filmmaker Jonas Mikis, constructed from thousands of hours of his own video and film diaries. And as is tradition, you all can now turn on your microphones and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much. So much. Thank you. And go see the show if you're in New York or Minneapolis. <laughs> and yeah. I'm looking forward to it traveling. Yeah, Thank thanks, everyone. everyone. Thanks, y'all. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye.